The Scudetto, where the soul of Italy meets the pinnacle of calcio. Catch Serie on CBS Sports Network and streaming live on Paramount+. Plus. It's never too soon for college hoops. It's the Emerald Coast Classic on CBS Sports Network. Reveille, reveille, donks. Look at us now, tip to tip. This is our life. This is our passion. That's the spirit we bring to this show. I'm Luke Thomas. I'm Brian Campbell. This is Morning Combat. A gobble, gobble to the O friggin' yeah. Hey, how about it? Thanksgiving holiday edition. Going to put our hands on the mail bag. Uh, well, we do have a lot of male viewers, so I guess it would make sense. Hey, it's Morning Combat. Welcome in. Brian Campbell right here. You know the guy next to me. Luke Thomas from the nation's capital. It's the day after Thanksgiving 2023. It's a Friday. You're probably in line at Best Buy because that's how you get down. But I'm sure uh, our competitors in this space are at home with their family. Luke Thomas, you know Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday. And as people watch this right now, it's... 24 hours away, by the way, from the final Showtime boxing pay-per-view on Saturday. Go Showtime, Benavidez versus Andrade. But, uh, you know, you fancy yourself a Turkey Day connoisseur as well, Luke. We're recording this in the space-time continuum after, before, to be seen after, but it was recorded before. Um, How fired up were you for this year's Thanksgiving? Pretty fired up. It was uh, hosted at my house. You know, as as we mentioned today, we're recording it. It is pre-Thanksgiving. You are watching it post. So I don't know exactly how it's all going to go because we're trying something a little bit different with the turkey, but I'm hoping that it has not been calamitous. And uh, I guess we'll see. I guess guess we'll see. Forgive me for being a gringo and being an ignorant jobber here. But are you going, is there any, was there any thought or attempt potentially here from the family to Columbia eyes Thanksgiving this year because that'd quite, be awesome. Not quite, not quite. Cu- Cu- Cuban style, a little bit actually. Yeah. Ooh, what does that mean? What does that mean in terms so, of the turkey? Turkeys serve two ways. One will just be baked relatively as normal, um, but then the other one we're gonna. Do you ever have you ever had ropa vieja? I mean, I'm saying it like a gringo. Have you ever had ropa vieja? No, no, so, no. It, so it literally translates to old clothes, but it's basically when you get shredded beef. And it's really tender, and you can pull it apart. You oh, know, that's yeah. What it is. And then you serve that on, like, tostones, or you can serve it whatever you want, really. You can serve it in, in any kind of thing. We're going to take half of it, serve, like, the legs and, like, the wings. We're going to just bake. And then for the breast, we're going to turn turkey breast. We're going to, di- we're going to you know, chop it up real nicely. And we're going to ropa vieja it. And we're going to have oh, tostones we're going to serve it on, which we're going to hand make. Um, with all the all, it's the it's currently sitting in a brine bath right now. So, you know what? This crossed. not only sounds delicious; it sounds a little sexy, Luke. Well, Mikey says that sounds <laughs> fire right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, here's the thing: I always say this, dude. Turkey's not a great bird. It's just not. It's hard oh, to make it, oh. you know, tasty. It's um, it's lean, and so therefore, it, you know, it's it's not the fattiest thing on earth, but it can be hard to make good. And I've been to so many people's homes. I'll go, well, you should have my Mimos Thanksgiving. Your Mimos Thanksgiving tastes like fucking... Okay, uh, well, tastes like first drywall. of all, tastes like first drywall. of all, that's what I called my grandmother, my Mima, okay? <laughs> yeah, French exactly. Canadian in the Dude, house. It all, so, tastes, uh, it all tastes so bad. It tastes so no, fucking tastes miserable. No, it tastes so good. The tortillere, Luke, the meat pie, come on. You got to get in Dude, that. You know and what everyone I mean? just pretends it's it. tasty, and I'm like, Dude, why don't we just make tasty food? How about that? Okay. Let's just make food You're right. That turkey good. blows. Turkey has always been lame and overrated. My family loves turkey sandwiches and turkey soup the next week. I'm like, you can keep that crap away from me. Everyone knows, Luke, it's about the fixings. We'll get into that on this holiday mailbag edition where we have solicited your questions curated by our own Mikey Mormile of CBS Sports on the ones and twos. We hope that you are in the process of enjoying a fantastic holiday weekend, unplugging from the job if you can, and uh, following us and liking us right there on the social channels. Uh, I know Turkey Day, Luke, is an intrinsically American experience, but is there a Colombian correlation to a celebration 
of breaking bread with the indigenous people of your nation before stealing all their land uh, for alcohol, <laughs> essentially, right? I mean, let's be honest about it. I don't think there's a direct corollary that I know of. Um, yeah, they're not too big on this one. The big one for them, as you can imagine, Christmas. Christmas is is like... Mm. It's next level for them. So, uh, so this one they, you know, they participate. They do. They they, they help out. But they're every all eyes are on Christmas in this household. Let me just tell you. Oh yeah, just like that great Tupac double album. You know what I'm saying? All, all eyes, eyes on, on me, me baby. Luke. That was. I mean, they, I think on the cover he's doing something like this. Is that West Coast Luke or did yeah, I just? Yeah, the blind like stares of a million pairs of eyes looking hard but won't realize that they oh, could yeah. never be. Damn. Yeah, yeah I think you just tripped over those hard ass bars over there. Yeah. All we yeah, need I'm is sure I fucked it up. Look, is that uh, drink cup you were drinking of a uh, coconut, a pineapple? What do we got going on there? It was a take on um, oh. Chewbacca. Bout it, bout it. And then my daughter broke the handle. Of course, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, Tuki. Uh, Luke, does has has the Tukes found joy in Thanksgiving? Is it is it something she's into? Because at that age, let's be honest, Christmas has got to be in her yeah. in her front you know view here no she doesn't give a shit that much i mean she's she loves her she has, she has a baby cousin my brother has a, has a baby boy so she's pumped to see him or have seen him at this point or whatever but uh that's about it man everything is like hey right. she's asked me every day this week when are we getting the tree like that's yeah uh, like i said man you know i'm keeping the american traditions alive here i'm you know i'm the last of the mohicans and uh everyone else just cares about feliz navidad around these parts Okay. Okay. Well, where I come from, Luke, we care a lot about Thanksgiving, mostly because of the high school football tradition. And this year, my Naugatuck Greyhounds will be facing Ansonia again on Thanksgiving for like the 130th time or something like that. And this year, both teams are 9-0, and so the NVL championship will be at stake where it belongs. But Luke, that school has royally kicked our freaking ace hole over the past three decades. So I How many kids be- go to that school? Your school? Uh, it's- my school, yeah, I had a big high school. It was Class L, so it was, uh, it was, uh, I mean, I think it was like fifteen hundred. Yeah, that's, not, that's about right. Yeah, how many in your graduating class? Three hundred and thirty-three. Okay, so yeah, and no, at least you'd, half you'd be, of those you'd are be dead size now. Size AAA I'd, or size four A yeah. in Georgia, not five A. Okay, okay. Where did, when you went to Valdosta, Luke? How many Valdosta. kids were there? Thousands, like just a huge high graduating school? class was at least five hundred, at least. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> All right, all right. Yeah, Luke, there you go. I can't get my kids to care about my high school alma mater. You know, they live. Where do they, they go? In- oh, they don't go to Naugatuck, do they? That's no, right, no. We live in like slums. we live in like the bougie Hartford suburbs now, but they just don't have that same that same care level, even for their own team. You know, they're just, listen. Just, if you go to a high school where you know that on a random Thursday you could get knifed, it changes your perspective on things. You you learn to appreciate the small stuff. You know. Yeah, you learn. Yeah, okay, wow. I mean, well, I, I won't say that's untrue, Luke, to be fair, but yeah, that was a little aggressive. And uh, there you go. All right. We're going to get you, dude, into it. I told you when I, when I went from Washington, D.C. schools to Northern Virginia schools, they were amazed at all of the, like, the very graphic insults that I knew. They yes. had literally never, I was like an exchange student. They had never heard, they're like, we had never even thought of this concept before. I'm like, dude, they've been saying that since first grade, you know? Yeah, but you you took from them though. You took a y'all. You've got a little south in you, Luke. A little okay? bit, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah, I, I did pick up a few things here or there, but not too many. Well, that's neither here nor there, as Luke Thomas would say. Let's dig into this here mailbag. But before we do, a reminder, folks, because it is Black Friday, freaking right now when you're watching this. That's right. uh, Morning Combat dot store. We've got, according to R.J. Dunkel, gangbang. Uh, Cyber Monday deals, Black Friday deals, White Wednesday deals, whatever, you know, whatever you're into, we got it right now. And I heard that he's, Luke, he told us he's trying to get rid of all the old merchandise, like all of it, all the early generation. Everything must go. I don't know if we're selling toasters. I don't know if we have an aisle to fight over it, but we want it out of here. So go get it. Damn. That's what I'm talking about. Morning combat dot store get this mug actually this mug's too small don't get this one get the bigger one that they yeah sell. i don't like that mug i don't use that yeah. mug that often rj just... how about you sell all these are right here okay let's get rid of these off the table we'll just all check right. them out the window Malka won't notice <laughs> <laughs> uh this one's from at johnny 138 138 which is hopefully parts of his social security number uh he wants to know he says happy thanksgiving to both of us so that's great uh he wants essentially a power ranking of our top five mm. Thanksgiving foods. This included concludes, he says, main courses and sides 
I always appreciate the content and laughs. And by the way, Cannibal Corpse's best album is Tomb of the Mutilated. Mutilated, yeah. You agree with Johnny there? Yeah, it is. He's right. Mm -hmm. Now, serious question here, Luke. Seriously, what makes that better than the other one? Seriously, what what is it? That you're gonna laugh at this, but like honestly, their lyrics have gotten significantly tamer over time. <laughs> okay. What yeah, themes? Like, are, if they're not talking about urine in the bloodstream, Luke, what themes are they onto now? All right. Or well, blood I mean, in let, the urine. Let me pull stream, up. Maybe, let me pull up know? the track, the, the tomb of the mutilated track list. Um, here, I'll tell you. So, this album is the one that has their biggest song, "Hammer Smashed Face," which is yeah. literally about a, is, is literally a song. Let me put this down a little bit. Is literally a song about a guy um, expressing his joy and need for smashing another person's face with a hammer. Uh, then they also have "I Come Blood" on this album as well. "Post Mortal Ejaculation" is on this album. Okay, beyond the while cemetery. You, while, while you certainly have <laughs> offended and appalled me with the song titles, what makes this record better, Luke? Is it the songwriting? So I would is say I would say that they had again. This was them. Peak is not quite the right word, but this was them at their most unrestrained, which is why you'd be listening to this kind of music to begin with is for its lack of restraint. And they were heavily leaning into the darker imagery. And also, you know, if you listen to if you listen to Hammer Smashed Face, just from a musical standpoint, it's very rhapsodic. It changes in a lot of different tempos and directions and um, sounds and it kind of is all over the place. This album and this rec this these the better songs on this album, they're much more uh, playful is not the right word, but they were doing more from a musician musicianship standpoint than I think they have been in some of their more recent records. This was a big one. This was a big one. All right. Well done right there. Uh, Luke, to get back into the spirit of the question from Johnny138138, which is, as Luke would say, just a horrifically bad name. Um, just the worst. Our top five Thanksgiving. We're, we're both saying turkey way overrated. So, Luke, what what would be your top five pound for pound list? And when you look at the spread, whether it's at your house, your brother's house, whatever, what are you looking for? What stands out the most in order? I'll just, I mean, here's the thing. Most Americans are like, I'm going to eat green beans that my meemaw made. And I'm like, just just, just rummage out of the trash like a raccoon while you're at it. If we're, not... about non, if we're talking about non-peasant foods, um, I'm going to say shrimp cocktail. I think a shrimp cocktail. Oh, not I'm with the dinner even... itself. Hold on, hold on. Not with the dinner itself. But when you show up to the party, what kind of foods do they have to nibble All right, on? all right. A little yeah. shrimp cocktail. A cheese, some kind of decent cheese plate, you know? Um, probably number, number th oh, that'd be five, four. Three, I'm going to say, ooh, that's when, this is when it starts getting tough. Mm. I do, I'm, I'm, are you a big Brussels sprouts guy? I'm not a big Brussels sprouts no, guy. No, who is? There's not a single damn person. Like maybe 60-year-old Polish women. That's probably yeah, it, Luke. That's probably it, right? So I don't. You, I, I'm not that guy either. I will say I don't mind the cake. I could eat a green bean casserole every once in a while. I don't think it's. I don't, I don't know if I'd rank Dude, it. Your that top high. five blows. What kind of Hold plate on. is this? What are you doing? Oh, look at Mikey. I'm Team Brussels sprouts, Dude. That's because you're okay, you got yeah. seventy five thousand well, milligrams of marijuana in your tummy when you eat it. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I'll say this. Number one is going to be mac and cheese. Number one is just right. going to be mac and cheese. Like, eat shit. It's the best. It's, turkey, I'll put two or three. So it's something like Wait, that. This is the worst Thanksgiving list of all time, Luke. It really is. I mean, look, No, because I'm what you're going to do. No, here's what you're going to do. Here's what you're going to do, because I know you. I know your bitch no, ass. Here's what, what you're going to do. What do you know? What do you know you're about gonna, You're going to name but, foods that, you, that sound really great and no. sound very Americana. And then when you actually get those foods, the vast majority of them taste like the backside of Barbus's nutsack. That's that's the you've actual had a reality good, here. A good legitimate Mima's turkey dinner, and my mom makes a great one too. I got a lot of. I don't. I just don't believe one. this. I don't believe this. All right. Well, that list is horrible. And while I certainly love myself a good mac and cheese, and don't doubt that you were raised eating phenomenal mac and cheese on Turkey Day, that's your number one pick of like. Ranking the the foods in order on Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving foods are not that good. They're not. No, that they're good. the best. That's no, what they're not the that good. Is. The mm -hmm. only issue here is that the main course, the turkey, is the most overrated thing ever. Everything else is through the roof insane. Hold the on. Only problem... Here's here's a real basic litmus test for you. Ready? Do you like the gelatinous cranberry sauce? Oh yeah, you got to go as poor and off the can as possible. Anytime. Yeah, you I mean you're 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 a you're a raccoon. Place, 
no. eating out of the dumpster. No. That's what you I'm are. I'm an American, Luke, with pride <laughs> for my high school's football team. Okay, all right, that's what it is. You know, pride to try to win the backyard annual touch football game at Uncle Tony's every year. That's what matters on Thanksgiving, Luke, okay? Who can forget the bloody toe game back in like 04? All right, who can? Not me. Are you also going to turn ultra MAGA like Kurt Schilling? <laughs> I was talking about the bloody toe game that I had in the backyard. Oh, right, 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 right. All right, here we go, Luke. The only problem is trying to actually rank these in order. Let me do it reverse, I'll tell you. Number one is meat pie, tortier, Luke. That is the, that is that. the centerpiece of my Thanksgiving growing up. Yeah, the turkey was there. But when Mima rolled out the meat pie and now Aunt Judy and Aunt Gail and Aunt Di, they can make a mean one too, Luke. But when they roll that out, I mean, it's all bets off. And it's like it's like beef, pork, chicken. There's probably like pieces of the late John Madden in there too, Luke. There's just all kinds of meat in there. And it's just That amazing, thing on okay? Frank Beamer's face, you know? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that, that thing. Wow, that thing's fantastic. Uh, number two is stuffing. And again... There are certain things in my life that need to be elite or I'm not touching it when it comes to food. Barbecue ribs is that category, by the way. But for some reason, there's just comfort sometimes in cheap, cheap cranberry sauce right out of the can with no with no no physicalness in it. Right. Give me the give me the weak stuff. And my number two stuffing, it could be cheap stuffing, but do it right. And it is a number two uh, and it will make you take an excessive number two. Um Number three here, box stuffing, Mikey. You're damn right it's great. Thank you. Number three here is um, chocolate cream pie because it is the, the go-to. Oh, I didn't know we were doing desserts. All right. It's the winner. It's the absolute winner. I agree with that. Um, I agree with that. Number four would be, it's a tie because they're so, they go together, Luke, like Simon and Garfunkel. Um, it's it's corn and mashed potatoes. And then obviously you have to add the gravy on top of that, but just corn and mashed potatoes together essentially it will make up 65% of my Thanksgiving plate because I, you know what I'm saying? Everything else just kind of flows off of there. Right. It's fantastic. Uh, for number five, I'm going to go with, uh, when done right, a green bean casserole can absolutely win and actually make you feel like for a second, you're doing something healthy when you're really not. If you do that right, it can. Um, but you know, some people like weird stuff like fish or lasagna on Thanksgiving. Stick with the American basics is where I'm going there. And that's the countdown that that's what it is. Oh, are you are you uh, which one are you pumpkin or pecan pie or pecan? However you want to say it. I mean, I'll eat them all, but neither of those two really make my go to list. But uh, pumpkin's fine. I mean, a good ass pumpkin's fine. Pumpkin's better than pecan pie. Pecan pie I'm, I'm, or pecan again. That yeah, that's for, that's for women, Luke. And that's no disrespect to women who eat pecan pie, but it's it's for them. That's Did a I little sound much, like but okay. 19... <laughs> was that a very 1957 line for Yeah, me? I mean, that wasn't right. really accurate in any kind of way, but, you know, it was what this show was really. Morning Combat, not really accurate in any kind of way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not representative of the opinions of most of the people who pay us. But let's go to question number two. This is from at <clears throat> Rudum Cheeks. 1775. You Rudum know this guy watches Cheeks. an unbelievable amount of pornography. Run okay, Dim Cheeks. Probably. Yeah, 17, this think, guy's been running them cheeks since the before the American Revolution. I mean, do you guys think John Jones is at all envious of Francis Ngannou outside of the UFC? The success Ngannou has had outside, especially now that even if John beats Stipe, he will likely have to be Aspinall as well to be seen as the best heavyweight in MMA. Luke, do you think there's any part of John Jones that is like, damn, Francis just went and blew up getting Deontay money now? I'll say that not that he'd ever admit publicly, right? Like, do you think he's got a, a certain amount of jealousy such that he'd be willing to say as much on the record? I don't think so. Um, but, you know, because, dude, fighters are weird, man. They've all got Stockholm Syndrome, you know? Or not all of them, but, like, a lot of them. You know this, too. Like, I'm not telling anything, telling you anything you don't know. It's just so many of them get wrapped into the system, and then all they ever really focus on is success within that system, that that system is all that really ever matters to them. Which, in, in you know, in a big part of that, you can certainly understand. But then when you get these outliers, I, I would say that there's probably a part of him that is not thrilled that Francis, and or not thrilled, but like, you know, wishes that, you know, he could have some of the latitude that, that Francis has been enjoying. But, you know, I mean, here's the other part, too. Like, dude, John had a great career. John's career is not really lacking for much at this point. I mean, a couple of things here or there that could have gone better. He did, in the end, I'm sure, 
make a good amount of money, not what he should have made, but probably, you know, I don't think he's poor. Let's put it that way. So probably somewhat is my answer, but not, he's not somebody who like never fail or excuse me, never really reached their full potential. I mean, even with all his fuck ups, he reached his full potential, you know, it's like he's the outlier of all outliers. So probably a little bit is my answer, but not much. Luke, we ask the really hard questions on this show, and I think in some ways that's what separates us from the others. That's why we hoist them awards. So I have to ask you a really hard question. Would oh, you be more comfortable allowing the John Jones of his 20s or of his 30s to house sit for you while you're on vacation? I don't know. I'm not, I guess 30s. All right. Um, All right. But, you know, not like that one's been uh, uh, the mark of – the straight and narrow and stability either. I, so. I didn't enjoy asking that question. I don't enjoy hearing the answer, Luke. But it, you know, Brian I, Campbell, I really don't like you, so I'm not going to answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go over to the next one. This is at Hulkman245. This guy's uh, got the worst physique on earth. I guarantee it. Go what, ahead. What is going to be the next big change in the UFC or MMA? Well, look, I think Bellator and PFL getting together is a pretty damn big change. Luke, um, I was at, did you hear Don Davis chat with Ariel? Did you actually listen to a little, I didn't hear the whole thing, but I did hear parts of it. I, look, promoters at their best are used car salesmen that, that just can charm you and, and fire you up or whatever, right? Like, I get it. This guy's a successful businessman, no different. But he really made me want to, like, believe in his cause and, like, the company and the vision that he has after that. Like, it was a really strong presentation in a field where we normally just expect these guys to be crooks and we're just waiting for the lie. I'm not saying he lands this plane perfectly, Luke. He may not be Sully Sullenberger, but he he does have access to a lot of money. And I just think the presentation, like for all you and I did to react to PFL and Bellator merging, we didn't really know all the facts. We're trying to figure it out. Hearing him lay it out, it, it almost made sense. Is that crazy? It didn't make much sense to me. Um, but, you know, I've got some more questions for, well, as you're watching this, probably today is the day of the PFL event in D.C. So maybe today I'll get some answers to those questions. I mean, I think some of it made sense. But, I mean, in general, it's like we have five fighting franchises. It's like, dude, you don't need that. You just need one successful one because yeah, all five don't all work. Yeah, they all feed into each other. Like, it, it's, that's just Do they? and walking around. Tell, so. me, tell me your favorite fight from the uh, uh, the uh their version of the Contender Series, the one that aired on FUBO. Well, I'm not going to watch it until they give me a well, reason. Well, then, then, what, it, then what is this? Then what is this? It is nothing. It is behind okay, a paywall that, that no one saw. That's extraneous parts of the overall presentation, which is – We've he listed it as one of their five like subsidiaries, which is, which is we have inhaled this Bellator roster, and even though I know you guys don't want us to have two brands because you're assuming that means we're just going to split the roster, it seems the reality is that he said uh, the fighters will have the choice of either entering the tournament mode with traditional PFL or being a one-off fighter for Bellator and, you know, where you could fight for titles or whatever, but you're you're only fighting twice a year on that side. Like, the fighters are going, going to get to decide what is the best path for them. That's that's kind of interesting. That's not all – like, that's new and fresh and not awful is what I'm saying here, Luke. That's what they say. I'd be very curious to see what the actual reality is because they'll have to manage that. If everyone decides they don't want to fight in Bellator, if everyone decides that they do – um, you your system doesn't work. So that's going to have to be managed and leveraged. I don't quite believe that. All right. Well, whether or not this Pelator PFL discussion signifies the next big change in the UFC or MMA, Luke, how would you answer Hulkman's question? What do you think is the next big change? And that, that seems very generic. So which way are you going to go with this? I think that the next big change is all likely going to be a function of what happens with this lawsuit. The fighter, the fighter class action lawsuit. Just this week, we found out we thought before there would have to have been a secondary case, the Cajun Johnson case, that they would have to win in order to get injunctive relief. And if you're asking what that is, that's what that's the ability for the court to then change the UFC's business practices, not just award a certain amount of money. But now it turns out that they don't. They only have to win the Lee versus Zufa case, the original one from 2011 to 2016, basically. 
Um, and if they win on those terms, they will be granted injunctive relief. And again, maybe they all settle. And that's the other part too, BC. Maybe we don't even go to trial, but we get a settlement. And in that settlement, we get some measure of financial compensation for these guys, which I don't think is that big of a deal, but some measure of a change in business practices as they seek to avoid trial. I don't know. One way or the other, some resolution is going to happen there. And I think that's going to be the next big change. Yeah, it could be. It could be very well. And a good transition from this point back into the PFL discussion comes to us from at Sensei John 84. Question for you both. If you ran the PFL, what would be your plans for Bellator in the first year of acquisition? Yeah, uh, fold it immediately. I- Fold that immediately emerged the rosters. So, but look, the way that he broke it down, meaning Don Davis when talking to uh, Ariel on the MMA Hour, was that the fighters, like I said, would have the choice to go either way and that they still want to employ, they still want to have it all, basically. They want to have their regular season playoff meritocracy thing so they can boast that they're fighter first and all that, which is cool. I like that. But then they also want to be able to pair exciting names against each other uh, in the in the two pay-per-view cards that they promised and then they want to have the ability to roll out really fun fights for titles using the already established Bellator brand and I don't I think that's the reason why they've kept it around is because and we hinted at this the other day Bellator has made successful inroads throughout parts of Europe where the brand is you know means something I mean look at the shows in Dublin and stuff it's like a packed house so I don't, I'm um, not sure I believe that Hey, whatever. That's the way they're saying it. So my point here is, uh, uh, I don't know what my point was, Luke, but uh, th- that's what that's what their plans are for year one. So this question is, what would be our plans? You're saying, so you see no value. Okay, here's the question I'll ask you. Do you see any value in the way Don Davis is laying it out that they essentially want to be just that, all those things at once, but still be the same company? But you can't. You have to pick. Dude, I mean, just the, dude, this this whole strategy is quite ludicrous. And I, the, let me just put my my chips on the table now. It will not last. It will not last. This is not a thing that they're going to scale up from. And if they scale up from it, that's not going to last either. This there will be a contraction. They will remove several of these pillars, if not nearly all of them, to protect this brand. It doesn't work. It's so confusing and so myriad. You have no idea as a fight fan what actually you're tuning in for or what you're discovering when you do this. You're not finding a single solitary identity. And of course, the UFC at this point has a, has a vast array of different types of products. Um, that's also true, but they've only done that after they had a single solitary product that took off first, and then they began to branch out. Just branching out in the way that you're doing and having this confused mixed product, which you're not sure which end is what and what matters more than the other, this is a doomed and failed strategy from the word go. Also, let's be curious about, let's be clear about something too. I looked up how much Viacom bought Bellator for in 2011, and the answer was about $50 million. They sold for not much more than that. In fact, Don Davis told Ariel Hawani that they didn't even put up any cash. They just gave them stock options. Dude, Bellator was not a success. It was a failure. We should just say that out loud. It was a, it was a failure in basically every way. It did not achieve what it was supposed to achieve. It does not have a fan base. And this idea that you can go to uh, Ireland and you have to have the Bellator brand on there to do well is just total bullshit. All you have to right. do is have the same fighters you had on there and then a decent promotional effort, and you'll be just fine. You'll do as well, if not better. Um, also, I looked up Bellator's old ratings on Spike. Dude, they were clearing you know well above 900,000 at times. They were doing 15% of that by the time everything wound its way to showtime. Why on earth, why on fucking earth would you keep a brand that damaged, that dead, alive? It makes zero sense at okay. all. Fucking close it, so- fold it, and do something else. I'm not as pessimistic as you are, but I understand your pessimism, and I think you successfully laid out the reasons why. And also, let's look at history of people who have tried to compete this aggressively against the UFC to literally what Don Davis is saying. He wants to be like the co-leader in the space, and he expects to be. So some of this seems like a wing and a prayer. I understand what you're saying about the, the brand confusion, but also he's saying that they expect to get separate TV deals for both brands. So is that a smart long-term so as i said previously uh, as i said hold on to to build the financial infrastructure yes as i said previously the one exception to what i'm saying is if by dividing the product you can at least in the short run make more money 
by virtue of having different television rights deals in different places and using that to make more money than you would if you just had a single pot. I can understand that. I can understand that as a short-term play. But even that short-term play still doesn't solve for the the brand. Like if so, I had to ask you, you know, what the PFL brand is, they're telling you it's five different things. You know, oh, it's the tournament. It's a tournament. But really, it's not just a tournament. Like they want to get the pay-per-view thing going. That's part of it. They want to now have Bellator. That's part of it. They want to have international series. And by the way, remember, part of what Francis is supposed to be doing is not just, you know, being part of the, the pay-per-view side, but to now launch PFL Africa. Is that actually going to be a thing? Are you going to launch PFL South America? Are you going to launch PFL yeah, no, Asia? Like what timelines. Do you hear the timelines you gave Ariel that they would be popping up? Around there'd be a Middle Eastern one that's going to launch what next year? He thinks the yeah. Africa one will be two years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, again, it's just this enormous brand confusion that doesn't make any sense. So I do get that in the short run. Hey, if we split this up, we can make more money while we figure out our next move. Fine, I get that, but that doesn't solve the other problem. It's only a short term. Let's say two years or less. Only a short term play that you could do. Beyond that. You have to fold the brand. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. I mean, we got to see. I think, you know, we do have to see the TV deal that he said that they would be announcing two weeks after this weekend's championship and did tell Ariel that they want to do that Bellator versus PFL, like launching pay-per-view in like February, ideally. But or did I don't know if it's going to be a pay-per-view that wasn't. Uh, but I, I get it. I get everything you're saying across the board uh, of we got to wait and see. And boy, is this ambitious. But, like, think about it. I, I've already declared that, like, they either pass or fail based on their ability to draw free agents. So brand confusion aside and also financial reality aside for a second, because it only makes sense if they're actually making the money to keep all of these boats afloat and do this. But if they want to become a an attractive base as a free agent landing, I do feel like they're making the right moves by presenting themselves to be so fighter friendly by then saying, okay, like our, he, he acknowledged what, what is true. Their regular season format is a freaking, you know, it's walking into that, the propeller and Raiders of the lost Ark that that dude took the L on against Indy Luke. I mean, you're going to, you're getting chewed up and spit out. That is not for everyone. And especially not, fighters that could be leaving the UFC was still something left in the tank, but why are you going to just put them, siphon them through that meat grinder? So aren't they presenting a, a potential home where it looks like they have deep financial backing in Saudi Arabia, celebrity investors, and on top of that, they're saying if you get to the pay-per-view level, you get 50-50 revenue split, and whether or not you want to be in this meat grinder season, we can give you a space to fight twice a year in fun creative matchups under the Bellator brand. Again, I don't know if this works. I'm just saying the presentation, it doesn't deter me or make me or make me automatically feel like, yeah, good luck to you. I kind of want to sit back and see if they can do it because this is bold as shit, Luke, the no, way they're setting no. it up. But only one of these things works to save them. Only one of these things works. We know for a fact the Bellator model doesn't work. At least the, the model as uh, I should say that's not quite right. We know for a fact Bellator is a dead product, right? We know that. We also know that PFL has no audience either, no genuine like built-in big audience where just the PFL brand itself can do anything. Those seasons are interesting, but as we've talked about on MK a million times, it's a bridge to nowhere. So you've got this international series, which I'm not saying that couldn't become anything, but right now it's not anything, right? As, do you know what? It, I, if, can I stop you? Do you actually know what it is? The international series will be eight shows, seven of them outside the U.S. Uh, in which you're guaranteed to get a Bellator title defended in the main and co-main. They'll keep the same divisions as they have now, it seems. Yeah. And if you don't want to go into the regular season tournament format, Dude, you can this fight is in all, This is all complex, ridiculous bullshit. What they're trying to do is like, here's what we're going to do. The UFC is restrictive, so we're just going to give you every option we're mm -hmm. going to give you the bellator option we're going to give you the overseas option we're going to give you the tournament option we're going to give you the pay-per-view option we're going to give you all of these options the only part of that that meaningfully changes their future is whether or not the pay-per-view division can get going by having access to the top tier stars of the sport that's it none of those other things make this product work not now not tomorrow not ever not saying you couldn't get interesting fights you can get interesting fights. Not saying you can't get a quality product. 
you can get a quality product. You cannot sustain a mixed martial arts business without access to the, or I should say, an international class business. Because you can do like a king of the cage thing. But an international class business, you cannot do that without access to the very top pay-per-view stars. So this idea, like, we're just going to throw the book at you and you have all these different options. Dude, if you have two quarterbacks, you have none. Okay, if you have okay, five okay, business well, models, you have none. You just echoed what I think is true. The success of this long-term and this bold attempt to actually go head to head with the UFC, which is exactly what they're saying they want to do and expect to do. I understand the like the reticence to believe that it will happen or that all of these boasts will, will happen. But we're both agreeing that the free agent market will define it, whether they can become a legitimate free agent landing, especially if they're Saudi backed to try to get the real big names when when they become free agents that we're saying that they're going to need pay-per-view stars to make all this work. We all agree in that because you make your money in pay-per-view in the long run, right? That's how it works, right? All the time. You know, that's worked for Showtime Boxing too in the May, when they were in the Mayweather business. That's how it worked. You 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 made your money on that those really big ones and everything else evened out. Um, I believe what I just explained to you, whether or not you believe it'll work, isn't that like the perfect landing you would want as a free agent? They're telling you you can box on the side and we're not going to get in the way of that at all, which is how they explained it. And they're offering you a 50-50 split. Now, again, question all you want, whether whether they'll they'll be able to acquire the big enough stars to actually make that a thing. But if you're a free agent, Luke, why wouldn't you want that? Especially I don't know. Ask Derek under, Lewis why he didn't want that. Why didn't Derek Lewis want that? Especially if you were under a restrictive holding with the UFC and you've experienced some of BC, these. BC, why didn't Derek Lewis want that? What you're telling me is they're going to make an offer so attractive they're going to be able to attract free agent signings of a big of the of the of that upper tier of the pay per view market. Okay, well, why haven't they? Because why the, haven't it, they? Because <laughs> the launch, in my opinion, is now. Not it's not. No, I don't no. look at it the as contracts the UFC has are so restrictive that getting out of them on a reasonable time frame is uh, for the top going. Not not the not the not the. We're not talking about the sure. rank and file. The top top guys, they're hard to get on a free agent basis. They don't they don't exist very often. Um, and the right to match that the, the the UFC can match any offer that anyone else makes. The only question is whether they want to or not. So like this is the point I'm trying to make to everyone. Unless there is some kind of regulatory change, some kind of government top-down authority that changes the way the industry functions, none of this shit about we got this Bellator okay. approach, we got this international approach, we got this so you're, none of that shit's going to work. None of it. Your none doubt it. is essentially r rooted in these these guys don't become free agents. Look at what Francis had to do to dude, become a free dude, agent, right? How much money? Think about this for a second. You had Bellator under the Viacom ownership. So they had what? They had backing by this you know, multi-billion dollar company, which is now Paramount. But at the time, Vi and Paramount's, by the way, a different structure too than just Viacom. They're not identical companies. There's been some change in terms of uh, all the different holdings within it. But in 2011 in Viacom, think about how much money was pumped into that brand in terms of all of the attention and hours on Spike TV and all of the places that they wanted to go. And all I mean, they, we're talking enormous amounts of manpower, enormous amounts of money, enormous amounts of capital and resources. And what did it amount to? They ended with a whimper. You cannot make an alternate set of MMA heroes. It doesn't work. I've seen it too many times. You cannot do it. You can only do it if you take your heroes and mix them with yeah. the group that whoever the public perceives is to be that way. And as long as they remain under large lock and key, none of this shit is going to work, dude. Okay, so the lesson of Bell the lesson last thing, the lesson of Bellator for everyone should be it doesn't matter how who owns or you know how big the corporate backing is who owns you. It doesn't matter how much money you spend. It doesn't even matter how good your roster is because their roster was really good. It doesn't matter. The okay. only thing that you matters said, is your access to the top stars. Right, but you said it doesn't matter how much money you spend. Well, I think how much money you spend directly correlates to your ability to grab those big stars and i just we don't shall see. think we shall and see. i just don't think we have had a a financial partner in the combat sports space that could as dramatically shift the the the, the balance of power and i don't mean shift it to where pfl's number one ever i'm not looking for like a wcw near takeover of wwf historically and how we look at this but like 
Could they have moments? Could they make an inroads here? I think that the times have changed. If a fighter is going to try to, in some form, do what Francis did and take a stand and go through the free agent process, I'm not. I agree with you. It's not easy. But if anyone was ever going to do it, it would be now after the success Francis just had. I understand how much the UFC would aggressively try at every turn to resign them before their deal is up, offer them the world, go above and beyond all of that. Like, I'm sure they would aggressively play in that space. But we've never had this discussion when the other side had had the Saudi connection. Because, look, that is next level money. BC, that you just BC don't they see, have the dude. Saudi connection now. Why didn't Derek Lewis sign? Okay, but that's one person who I assume okay, for, wanted when, to when, stay when loyal was the, to the company uh, when, that, when that was, he knows when, he can get us. What? I'm, I'm just, I'm actually, I'm because I don't remember. When was the Francis PFL announcement? How long ago was that? Was that like six months ago? Something like that? Something? Yeah, I mean, it was a long time ago, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they haven't signed one fucking person. And it's right, not because but, they don't have the money. It's not because they don't have the money. This is the point I'm trying to make to everyone. People are like, oh, well, no one else can afford. Like, who could afford a Nate Diaz? Dude, PFL can afford Nate Diaz. They've yep. got cash, dude. They've got cash. They can afford him. Now, Nate's a different situation because he is free, and I don't know how he wants to pick his time. And maybe he goes with PFL. I don't know. But, you know, he's well, a bit Davis of a separate case. $15 million at stake if he yeah. wants to fight. Uh, this is my it? point. They, dude, they, if, if, if they want to pay for you, they can pay for you. But the issue is if the contract makes these guys on the carousel of availability so few and far between That's that it fair. basically doesn't even matter what it doesn't matter how much money you have. No, that you're right. That that regard you're 100% right. But to also look, one championship has a product. I know it's all called one championship in the end, but they're mixing different sports in there. You're saying because it's the same brand, the same no confusion that it's it doesn't matter comparatively to what they might try to do here. I, I would just say this. Let's let's posit a different question, right? Let's posit a different question, which is: Imagine that the fighter lawsuit uh, already finished, and then the judge came down and said, "Hey, every UFC contract is going to have an expiration of two years, no matter what." Right? I mean, you oh, can yeah. you can choose you can choose to extend. Like you could you could stay with UFC all you want, but the contract has to end after two years. Now what does that do? Well, now, motherfucker, that's a different ball game. I mean, that's a completely different ball game because now guys are going to be able to do the Canelo thing a little bit. Not quite like Canelo. He's a special case, but in the sense of I'm going to give you three fights, then I'm going to give you three fights, then I'm going to give you three fights. People, I made a point on Twitter, I think yesterday or Tuesday, and I had said, you know, like if you look at Bellator, PFL, and one, one appear, appears to be in like serious financial um, peril. And they may not make it out of the year unless they get some other Qatari investment. And so you're like, dude, the three biggest shows outside the UFC don't make money. And people were, were responding, well, then this should tell you just how good Dana White and Co. are. I'm like, no, let's flip it. Let's flip it. Imagine we have the exact same scenario, exact same rules, exact same contracts. Dana White uh, all of a sudden gets fired from UFC and decides to run one. He can't save them. Have him run PFL. He can't save them. Have him run... Uh, Bellator, he can't save it. These things cannot be saved because the industry is so tilted in such a way, it's almost, I'm not going to say impossible for those brands to make money, but very, 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 very difficult that even the best minds with huge financial backing, even they can't make money. That's a scary proposition about True. how the industry is regulated. Can though, can PFL have a, a flash can they have a four or five year period where they're not they're not compete they're not on even terms with ufc but they're making so much noise and they're splashing the pot so aggressively that maybe financially it'll never work out it'll never be able to be sustainable but can they are do you think they're willing to go like all in all in to like have a three four year run where they're making progress where they're knocking hard on that door they don't get there, but they're listen. They're, you know. They've got Jake Paul. I don't know what that's going to do for them. Uh, you know, but it remains to be seen. He has done well-ish. You know, he's done well on pay-per-view. I would say he's done well. They've got Francis. That's something. If they can sign Nate, that'd be big. You know, there's a couple of different moves they've made that I do think are pretty interesting. And I do think, by the way, I'm not like poo-pooing the idea of signing Bellator like, or, or buying it or whatever. Like, sure. I, I don't think that's a bad thing. It's just a question of what you're supposed to do with that. You know, I do think that buttressing your your roster with, with what they've got, do they signed a bunch of good fighters all like that. I mean, that's a very valuable thing. 
But that is not enough to really get you over the hump. The question you're asking is like, can they take that into overdrive the next few years? I think that they have to. I think that they have to. I don't think they have a choice. Yeah. Like you're no, not going to really just go get big. venture capital money forever. You got to do something with it. So and, yeah. And Davis was saying uh, he in his perfect world it would be Ngannou versus Wilder first quarter in a mixed rules match. And he did seem because here's how he said it. he said they're going to do two pay per views one early for one in the first quarter one in the fourth one and he already said Jake Paul needs a full year to train MMA so he would be the last one and he said even though Francis can make his own call on whether he's going back to regular boxing or doing this, that he feels confident, which probably if you read between the lines means they feel like they can offer Francis enough to get him to turn this way. But like, again, I'd be more interested in Francis versus Wilder in a boxing match right now than I would be in this equally as weird, but also I need to see mixed rules four ounce yeah. glove, basically an MMA. What would you think it would be an MMA fight with no takedowns or something? Something something like that. And by the way, people are like, oh, I don't know what that would mean. What would it mean? You know what it would mean? Motherfucking chaos. Godzilla versus Mothra. Count yeah, me it in. would be chaos. Count be me. The, pe- people yeah. acting like they wouldn't want to see Francis Ngannou and Deontay Wilder in four-ounce gloves. Get the yeah, fuck okay. out of here. Yeah, yes, you awesome. would. Okay, but would you rather see a boxing match? Right now, I'd rather see a boxing match. Am yes, I uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, I'm not saying it's the best choice. I'm just, okay. you know, it's like Thanksgiving, right? You go over there. Okay, it's not the number one or number two seed, but if number three is all you got, I'll I'll take a number three seed. Well, sure, all right. Your I'll, top I'll look five look like a, look like more like a sixteen seed, Luke. Okay, it looked like Prince. Hey, sometimes sometimes the sixteen seed can upset the one yeah. seed, huh? How about you, that? You remember UMBC. that? What? What was it? The eighty nine tournament where number sixteen Princeton lost by one to Georgetown. Do you remember that game? I don't. I don't. Oh, that was that was a big deal back then, Luke. Alonzo Mornings freshman year, whatever. Hey, let's go over to at UFC one two three five five. This is Dana. Uh, <laughs> would you rather write the greatest book, the greatest movie, or the greatest song of all time? Luke, it, you got to go greatest song right there because people like, dude, a great song. You you feel it. You 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 wear it. You you spend portions of your life living it. You know what I'm saying? I know I know a, a damn book can still move a mother effer, but I don't have the stamina anymore to do that old school technique. Okay, Luke, give me the song. That's cooler. Obviously, oh, it's cooler. Come on. Okay, so it's definitely, I agree with you that it's definitely not movie, but I am torn between book and song. Because oh, um, a book, dude, I don't know. Like, you don't read books, so this is hard for me to explain to you, but... <laughs> Like you've, do, well, okay. Well, let me ask you. Like, do, have you? Uh, do you have a favorite book? Even if it was a long time ago, was there a book let that you read? You. There was a <laughs> you question. Is this book? question? Is this was there a book that you read that really changed your perspective on something or made you like it sat with you for a while? Did you have an yeah. experience like that? Um, even though it never led me to uh, attempt to shoot anyone, uh, a catcher in the rye had a, had like that turning point impact of like, oh man, this is a different style of writing that I never necessarily considered and there was a little bit edgy and you know appealed to that wayward teen inside of all of us that upriser um uh 20,000 leagues under the sea as a kid was 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 like phenomenal oh i cried my eyes out after reading charlotte's web luke um i don't think that's uh, corny i don't think that's corny at all thank you thank you um you know uh, a merchant of venice was my introduction into shakespeare and uh while i did not go deeply down that road uh it was it was something luke it was an event it was it was all right you know yeah. but um i will say even though i'm only about a what a third or maybe maybe my math isn't good the way through the dune book by frank herbert uh luke it's so insanely great the way he wrote that the de- the detail the att- i mean you know everyone has their a great favorite novel luke but that thing is just gripping so i hope it keeps gripping me harder you know what i'm saying um so book and song i gotta admit the song is pretty great i'm gonna go book i'm gonna go book okay i think the book having something physical you can hold as well you know um and being able to go back to an individual passage and get something from it. And I mean, you know, if you think about it, what's the greatest, or I should say the most influential um, between books, movies, and songs, what of the three has been the most influential? I would argue the Bible, the Quran. These have been enormously influential uh, factors over human existence in ways that songs simply have not. Um, so I would pick book. 
I would pick book. Oh, uh, Luke, I read a book once where a guy froze to death outside. It was like a real famous one. You ever read that one? It was one? like a Robert Frost poem? Like... No, no. It was like a, it was an actual book. I don't know. who. Yeah, whatever. Who's the guy that did that? Uh, you mentioned yeah, Jules Verne and J.D. Salinger as your, two of your favorite authors. Um, well, I mean, I read I read part of their catalog. It doesn't, I don't know if I was, you know, whatever. Um, I'm an, enough on books. Who's got time for that, Luke? You know what everyone. I'm saying? Every, everyone has time Every... for books. Everyone. Literally, literally everyone. You're uh, like, who's got time for that? I'm like, prisoners, uh, <laughs> podcast hosts. We work okay. five minutes a week. You don't have time for books? No, no. Uh, this one's from at Dan Wesley 2913. Dan Wesley, Wesley. Any word on MVP signing with the UFC? And if so, how does him versus Conor McGregor. McGregor. Good Lord. Sound, sounds fantastic. Sounds like UFC 300 to me. Hey, nah. Don Davis told Ariel Luke that he was under the understanding that MVP had signed with the UFC or was about to or something like yeah, that. Yeah, my understanding is that as well, that if he hasn't already, it's imminent. Uh, but I, McGregor. You wouldn't like, like that, dude? Are you kidding I mean, me? Dude, like, McGregor's, McGregor's one of these guys. It's like he's like Lesnar. Like, you could pick, you know, not like current Lesnar, but, you know, peak Lesnar. How would peak Lesnar do against peak Tom Aspinall? How would peak Lesnar do against Daniel Cormier? It's like one of those ones you could like roll out and like they're all going to be pretty good versions of something. Um, don't we want to see MVP versus Wonder Boy? Isn't that the isn't that the move? Okay, while that would certainly be a move that I I wouldn't have an issue with and would obviously get very excited about for the same reasons you would. Him versus Connor at three hundred would be incredible, especially it has that like. Old UFC veteran has a chance to knock out Bellator upstart who thinks, even though he's not an upstart, I mean, MVP's like, he's like 36, be 36, 37 at this point. Yeah, like he, it's not, but you know, it's still, it's like Bell, career Bellator guy coming on in. Let's old UFC brand guy who needs a win. Like, I, and it's a matchup that either one can win for sure. I mean, you could see MVP lighten him up in some ways just as much as you could see Connor flatlining him, Luke. Uh, I don't know if that guy's still in Connor anymore, is it? I mean, can Connor still knock a dude out with one punch, you think, in the octagon? I don't know about probably, that. Probably. Probably. I wouldn't I wouldn't bet against it. Um I mean, it's not physically impossible, but I'm saying would it happen, yeah, yeah. you know? Would it I, happen? I, I've got to say I was gonna say, you know, MVP versus Mike Perry would be great in MMA, but they already fought bare knuckle and fucking Mike Perry is something else. Um Yeah. He's yeah, again, I'm 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 oh I'm great on MVP signing with UFC, like that's great, but like the McGregor fight was not like wouldn't be my top five choices, you know. I don't know. All right. This is from jo at Joshua Low seven three seven six. Hi Luke and Brian. Have either of you ever killed an animal, cooked it, and ate it? Yes. Uh hell no. What are you what are you kidding me? You've never gone fishing and then cooked the motherfucking fish? Okay, while I have gone fishing like twice, I did not catch it. Or no, I caught a one once with Rafe. You've yeah, been my fishing guy Rafe and I caught some. Twice? I okay, I have appeared at fishing spots highly intoxicated <laughs> many times. I've actually like tried and held the thing like tw two and a half times in my life. Dude, okay? I, I I've I have I have I lived a thousand lives. I can't believe some of the differences in our lives sometimes. Dude, I, first of all, I've been on a 50-mile canoe trip in the Okefenokee Swamp. That's a real fucking thing I did. Yeah, rained, yeah that's not rained, funny, you know. rained every single day, morning to night, no rest, no respite, no nothing. It was the one of the worst, most difficult trips I've ever been on. It was fucking horrible. Um, so I went fishing there a bunch, caught a bunch of stuff, s scaled it the whole bit, ate it. Um, I've killed deer and eaten deer, uh, butchered it. Um... um uh, what else have we killed? Uh, actually, I killed a rattlesnake once and ate it. That was an interesting. It was not very good. Was not very good. So, Luke, um, it sounds to me that you almost could like compete on Survivor, the the game show. Now, I know in reality you couldn't because like no. one night of not sleeping, you'd you'd turn into a bitch and then you'd be like <laughs> rage against the machine and somebody would die. But like short of that, um it sounds like you have some of those like Boy Scout natural early man skills. I guess I guess I've never told you this. This will this will make you laugh at me. Uh I reached the rank of Eagle Scout in the Boy Scouts. This is a revelation for oh, you. Oh my God, I didn't know this. Now it makes yeah. a lot of sense in reality yeah. knowing you, yeah. but 
Wow, that's actually that's a pretty commendable sword to pull. It actually is, Luke. When you say that's that, how I like, learned. Oh, okay. That's how I learned archery. That's how I learned how to make fires. That's how I learned. I mean, any number of things you can think okay, of. True or false? Did your lengthy time in the scout system, in some ways, provide a foundation for the transition to the military not being too much for you? When you were like, you know what, I could do this. I'm a freaking Eagle Scout, bro. Yeah, like, but I gotta tell that... you, like, yeah, yeah, it might have like played an influencing role like yeah i can do that but then you get there and you're like oh shit this is uh this is just way fucking harder like it's not even like they're like, people treat it like oh if you could do well there you could do well there mm, no no like that's not really true uh yeah but i did it i will say i stopped around i think i want to say i stopped at the end of ninth grade um because that's when i it runs through senior year doesn't it it does but then a i moved after my 10th grade year anyway and i think i'd stop before that because I had begun to be, you know, I was like, well, I think I like women more than the company of just Wait, other dudes. So. so you reached Eagle Scout like on a three-year advancement plan, like ahead of the normal age? I got Eagle Scout. I started doing Boy Scouts in fifth grade. I reached Eagle Scout by the end of ninth grade, yes. You must have some like bootleg South system where it's like it's like a GED equivalent of the Eagle Scout. No, I did it all. Um, dude, you you underestimate me consistently and you <laughs> well, assume... Well, you told me you can dunk in high school, which is... Obviously I don't, bullshit. I don't. I, I don't. I don't know why the basic realities of my life and the contours of it are hard for you to. I accept your story as it is. Granted, your story is the you know the average American loser, and so in that sense, it's very easy to. <laughs> No, it's, I'm the, teasing, it's I'm teasing, the loser I'm teasing. made good story. Luke. I know, I know, I know, I know. It started here and it ended up here. Like the stock is high. I get it. I'm just saying, like this is what I mean, man. I've lived. I've lived a. I guess I've lived a weird life. I don't know, but like. Because my life went in so many directions because of who my parents were and then what happened to them and where they went and I followed, it just went in a bunch of bizarre directions that it probably would never have gone in. Um, but I got experience through all of it, kind of got a taste of what I like and don't like, and then you know went a different direction where I was able to like forge my own adulthood after age 22 or whatever. Um, but yeah, I've done all that shit. I've done all that shit, man. Yeah, it's that canoe trip. That... that canoe trip, dude, that one sticks with me. I remember getting home. And like showing all of my like uh, gear to my parents or my mom and my stepdad at the time, and uh, we washed it and washed it and washed it, and we had this happen in the Marine Corps too with one of my uniforms. It we could not get it clean. Like there was nothing we could do to get that shit clean. We had to throw all of the gear away, all of it. It was wow. all garbage. Wow. It was so mildewed, ridden, and 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 just so it was like a sponge sitting on your counter. It was awful. Did you ever seriously consider a military career, Luke? I thought yes. you would be yes. somebody who who could have thrived in that and then retired at like age 40 or something, right? Here's here's what I thought. I thought what I was going to do was I'm going to try out the Marine Corps enlisted as I go through college, right? That's what I'm going to do. And I thought by the end of that, because there was a lot of guys in my unit who were doing the same things. There were guys who I, I, when I served with, I was, again, I was Hotel Battery 314, 4th Marine Division in Richmond, Virginia. And it was an artillery battery. Then I think it got converted to a rifle company after I got out. I don't know if they got converted back to artillery. So I think it's just an infantry company now. But back then it was an artillery company. And there were guys who I served with who went to like JMU. Guys who I served with who were students at like Virginia Tech. And I would ask them like, hey, what is your plan when you graduate? And they were all like, I'm just going to go become an officer. And, you know, because they were already Marines, they kind of already knew what to expect. And like, you know, they, they, they were able to go really well through OCS, Officer Candidate School. And I thought, oh, I'll just do that. But then I got to my senior year and I was like, man, I don't want to go die for George Bush. Like, I just don't, you know, I just don't want to do that. And uh, so I, it turned me in a completely different direction at that. 9-11 really changed a lot, um, probably. Yeah. And so I just I was like, fuck that. I'm not going to do that. So I just went and figured something else out. And, you know, here we are. I was, I, I, you know, I had gone to the 9-11 museum over the weekend in, in New York with my family. And it was insanely moving. But, like, my wife and I were trying to describe to my kids, like, you know, why it would be so moving for someone our age, you know, that they were like, oh, were, did, were you were you around the buildings when it happened? We're like, no, you know, we're an hour and a half away. But, you know, the, it was obviously like the fear of entering war and having attacks on your own uh, land. But um, what I was really starting to think about was how many people I knew who like had regular lives before 9-11 and then like quit their jobs, moved back home and became like full time drunks in like the one to two year aftermath of that. And that was like a reality of like a lot of people. Off you of know, that, what's you funny know? so many people from nine 11, you know, they like went and joined the military after that. And, you know, I don't want to disparage anybody else's service. Like if they feel like they got something out of that and, um, 
you know, that's what they wanted to do. Pat Tillman, right? I mean, I know it's a joke here on yeah. the show, but that's exactly what he fucking did. But I got to tell you, dude, all of the Marines I knew, all of the Marines I knew who joined after 9-11 because they felt like there was a sense of purpose, they all regretted it. Like every fucking one of them. Every one of them. Not so much the ones who went to Afghanistan, although I would be curious to know what they feel like now, but the ones who went to Iraq, like... I don't yeah. know, any, and I, I must know a hundred people who served in Iraq. I don't know one of them who thought that was a worthwhile use of their time, you know. And people wonder why so many trains break out in those parts, Luke. <laughs> that <laughs> right? was, uh, the, first time, the first time that happened to me, I'll tell you exactly where it was. I was at 29 Palms. I was at uh, an MOS school there, and uh, this dude, he was, he was, his name was Lance Corporal Vitale. He, woke, he was from Brooklyn, New York. He woke me up, and he was like, yo – do you want to go do this with us? And I was like, dude, I definitely oh, don't. Oh, oh, no, I definitely no. don't. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Could you take the sex trade with it to another barracks, please? Wow. Yeah, I was like, I don't want to all do right. this at all. Yeah, no. Yeah, thank you for that. Okay. Uh, let's keep the show rolling on that note. Wow. I don't know where we're going. At Gary G1818, do you think there'll ever be MMA on the holidays like the NBA on Christmas or the NFL? On Thanksgiving, that's a great point. Do you like what? I know the PFL championships isn't like really big enough where people would like a, a you know where people would think of it in those terms. But what if an event like that took place every year on January first, like a bowl game or? So we used to get uh, Japanese New Year in MMA sure. when Pride did Absolutely. it and stuff like that, and then that and then you obviously Dream did it for a little while, and even Ryzen tries it. Ryzen, yeah. Um, yeah, I see you. Uh, but, you know, the reality is those are fun, but they're just not what they used to be. They used to be gigantic. They used to be huge in MMA, and they had relevant MMA. Now they've got, like, fun MMA or, like, semi-relevant MMA. It's just not the same thing. But that used to be a big thing. I mean, the guy's kind of answering his question by himself. As long as the NBA is on Christmas and as long as the NFL is on Thanksgiving, no fight is ever going to compete with it, Right. NFL right. is a juggernaut here. I don't know how Europeans feel about it, but it's, it's fucking big here. NBA, you know, and they're not putting bullshit games on. They're not putting Wizards versus, you know, Pacers. They're putting on LeBron, Steph Curry, all the big stars. So as long as they're doing that, no, it's not going to happen. But, like, would it be cool, BC, to have a holiday where fighting was the focus of it and everyone rallied around that, I think it'd be sweet. I think it'd be cool as shit, yeah. So you wouldn't count 4th of July, which is typically like the early part of International Fight Week or sometimes not at all, but you know what I'm saying. It's around the same time. You don't think of 4th of July and think UFC International Fight Week. Yeah, I don't. No? All I don't. right, well... They used to do the the final... Remember when the final UFC pay-per-view was always like real close to New Year's Eve? Yes. Yes, that always and there was like there, there was a year there. There was a year there. I forget. Like they put out this great uh, trailer for it, where uh, Clay Guida was like burping in it, and it was, all this like action was happening. And they had a UFC. I think it was not a pay per view, but I think they had like a fight night card on January one, and that yeah. was awesome. So it was the morning of January one, and you had a brand new UFC event to look forward to that night. That was or that that day. That was great. That was awesome. Yeah. Would you say that the uh, lacrosse national championship game has Memorial Day on a lockdown? You're messing with your poster. Yeah, it's, or maybe it's messing with me, Luke. That's that's uh, <laughs> that's something to think about. Um, all right, uh, Luke, you want to keep going? Or are we going to roll yeah, this we can thing go. up? We, we, we talk so much Bellator, we, can, we should be able to fire through a few more of these. Okay, at Brendo1136, do either of you have uh, any book suggestions on the business of boxing Ooh. or MMA, history and structure, et cetera? On the business. That's a little bit. Uh, there's no book on yeah. the business of boxing? There's probably a million great ones. I just haven't read them. Um, you know, do you have uh, a favorite boxing book? Yeah, I'm not as deep in the because I don't read Luke, so I'm not as deep in this field as like you would hope I would be. I definitely have read some of the classics and have enjoyed them. I mean, The Four Kings by George Kimball stands uh, stands alone in in most of my brain, Luke. But um, no, I don't have like a business of boxing go to. This is the great one. Um, I will say this. So there's if you're talking about the history of MMA, which is not exactly what he's asking. Um, but how it got built. Let's Get It On by Big John McCarthy. His book is pretty good for that. I like that yep. book. BC, I just started this one. I cannot give you a review because 
Um, I don't have. Uh, I can't. I can't review it yet. But I literally just started it this week. Hang on. This one. Cage Kings by Michael Thompson. Um, and this guy is was a hardcore MMA fan turned writer. And he's supposed to go into the whole industry and how it got built and everything else. So I'm not recommending it or not recommending it. I just don't know enough about it because I yeah. literally just started it. I would read um, the shit out of that because that's that that's the story of the last couple of years leading into the Zufa purchase. And, you know, the next couple of years after that does not get told. Like yeah, so the, in, the, the, in the, the subheading of this book, it's called Cage Kings. The subheading is BC. How an unlikely group of moguls, champions, and hustlers transformed the UFC into a $10 billion industry. Um, it sounds pretty good. It sounds pretty good. So we'll see how it is. Uh, I will say this. The one book I always recommend in martial arts that I read that I loved was on the history of judo. It's called Falling Hard. And yeah. um, it's fantastic. It is so fucking good. And they get into the history of how Sambo was made. And you may not realize this. The guy who invented Sambo, Stalin eventually had him killed. Uh, because Stalin was... Joseph Stalin of, of the USSR was obviously very paranoid and uh, would often have academics or other influential people in society that he thought could be perceived as a threat killed um, or disloyal or whatever. And so they, this guy invented Sambo essentially for the Russian military, or at least developed the first set of techniques and the set of ideas that I think eventually became Sambo. And then Stalin eventually had him killed, um, which really sucks, but... It's a great book, man. Falling Hard. You can get it on Amazon. Yeah, like, recommend except it more. for the way that guy got brutally murdered. It's a fantastic read, though. You know, I mean, it's not a Hallmark movie. Christmas movie. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. uh, by the way, BC, I meant to ask you about this. Now, I know this is Thanksgiving, but now we have to pivot into Christmas a little bit. My local theater, the one I can walk to, they're showing for the 20th anniversary of the movie on the big screen, Elf. Thinking yes. about taking Tukey. Is that an okay call, so, you think? Yeah, there's a there's three theaters, not one all that close to me, but three theaters in this area that are doing that same thing. And one of my kids was real into that idea and wants us to do it. I told him that like that movie's not old enough yet to demand that type of reverence Ooh, and service, even though it is mm. obvious, even though it is obviously not only a Christmas classic, but like arguably the best Christmas movie ever that you could just watch shamelessly because, you know, that used to be the Christmas story and then TV, TBS ruined it or TNT. They probably had a hand in that too. Um, but I think that that holds the thing, but I'm also like, I don't know that that movie still feels like kind of new. I don't want to go to the movie theater for it. You know what I mean? It's not, I'm not there yet. Like if you're like, Hey, let's go see. It's a wonderful life. I did that a few years ago in the theater, Luke. And it was, it was awesome. You know, it was like old timey elf's not old timey, right? 20 Francisco. years ago. Yeah, I guess if you're young, but you know, people with old balls like us, Luke, twenty years goes by like that, right? Yeah, just, I was already just, I was already out of college by two thousand three. Like, ooh, yeah. you know, I'm di I'm slowly dying in front of everyone. That's yeah, you no no doubt about that. Uh, from the inside out, Luke. This is from Ham Slice McDougal eighty eighty. Luke, since you don't drink as much anymore, how many drinks would it take? Now for BC's rear naked choke to get the tap or nap scenario. Four, four. I'll, I think the over under it right now is clearly three margaritas, Luke. Right? You know what I mean? That's like the uh, the Mendoza line right there. The you know. <laughs> yeah, three or four. Yeah, three or four. I will tell you what, guaranteed three Long Island iced teas and it might be curtains for your boy. I got to be yeah, honest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Um, all right. Let's go to Ad Edward Scape. Hey, Brian, do you watch tape or instructionals? What is your favorite on BJJ? <laughs> 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 well, I mean, why don't you? Why didn't you just ask me to read a book? I mean, really, right? You know, or do SAT math live on MK from the eighth row? Um, yeah, that's not happening. Dude, I told you I bought that Ray Mercer, uh, that Ray Mer it wasn't on BJJ Fanatics, but I bought a Ray Mercer like tutorial because it was cheap. It was like, like six bucks or something. I was like, fine, yeah. whatever. I'll just buy it on Amazon. And then he literally tells a story about how Tommy, he was like trying to explain the, the, the depth of the body punch. And he literally explained that Tommy Morrison punched him so hard that it caused him to fart audibly in the match. Um, he was like, he, and he goes, I'll just be honest. He hit me so hard. I farted. I thought it's so loud. Yo, that's a hilarious story. 
which is always offset by the fact that that ending of that fight was one of the most brutal endings of any fight of all time. Yeah. Remember the ref let Mercer get like seven unanswered, unnecessary yeah. shots? Yeah. yeah. I don't know what was going on there. But that was a great fight because that happened in a couple of Tommy Morrison fights, even ones he lost. Dude, he would come out like a house of fire and light people up. But if they didn't go down, you know, he could get caught. Uh, he was fun, Luke. And he definitely fought with HIV that time in, uh, I said New Mexico. That What was it, Arizona? I thought Arizona. it was West Virginia, but I could be wrong. About no, that too. It, it, we looked it up. It was definitely Arizona at okay. the end of the day. Um, so no tape. Uh, I should. Yeah, maybe I should start watching some instructionals on like. Um, no, I won't do that. Uh, you know what? If if Cody McKenzie put out one specific, you know, specific to the McKenzie team, I would actually watch that. Luke. I'd be down for that. OK, yeah, it wouldn't be that long of an instructional, but yeah. Would you help narrate that or co-host it with him? Would you, can we make this an no. MK project? No. How about, dude, I got it. You and I get the MK camera once we get like a big budget and stuff and we hit the road and go to the inventors of famous moves like the Makia teen and just have them like roll with you and break it down. But then like I'll hover over you. And at some point, eventually you'll be in a point of no return hold that where you're going to have to like tap or nap. And then I'll get in your face and like teabag you and crotch chop Luke. But that'll be like the gimmick of the show. And then like, sounds go off and like uh we get it pre-set up where like confetti falls down luke and that's like the moment in the show you know, i gotta just... tell you a, a a segment where you just ritually commit sexual assault on me i don't think is gonna sell too well to sponsors <laughs> <laughs> luke it's what sets us apart though it is at the end of the day yes, yes so tell yes. us about your podcast well we <laughs> talk about combat sports and we sexually assault one another and uh the audience seems to respond. I don't. We don't quite get it. Wow, well, it's going to be wild when we get Tom Espinall on here, Luke. Believe that, you know. Um, I still can't get over that that he did that. Being like, oh yeah, I'm finger, told but, that we didn't sorry, frame what? it properly, and that she had asked him a equally ridiculous question right before that, and then he kind of countered. But either way, Luke, you can't really say that on camera. I mean, someone's going to cut it out and do exactly what just happened right there. I mean, all right, let's go at Tiger Kuma ten eleven. One zero one one. I don't know. What is that? Uh, if the UFC could take any three Bellator fighters, would Aaron Pico Ooh. be one of them? I hope it would be right. It okay, so be. let's think. If you're if you're Dana and you can pick any three, got to be Patchy Mixes one. Right? Yes. Yes. Who uh, else? Nemkov. Usman Nurmagomedov. Usman Nurmagomedov. Okay, that's two. And then you could argue, no, it wouldn't be Pico. You're right, because you'd have to go AJ McKee as a possibility for that third slot. You'd have to go Nemkov possibility. Johnny Eblen is an, is not bad, Luke. Good call. Not bad. Good call. Um, yeah, I don't know if it'd be Pico, to be honest with you. Yeah. I would have said Amasov until that loss, obviously. But, you know, there's certainly, uh, I mean, I know it'll be short. But do, do you think, okay, here's how I'll set it up. Michael Chandler came to the UFC under the premise that he's going to be there for a short time, great time, whatever the phrase was, not a long time. And he's been a firecracker that has just set himself off in really fun fights, some for titles, some not, but he always brought it. Could Patricio Pitbull have the same, maybe not success, but a similar two-year run, three-year no. run in the UFC? No? Doing that no, same thing? I think, to he's, like I think he's too many. I think he's too damaged. And... Um probably further along in his decline than Chandler was at the same time he went. Okay. Dude, now what, what, fucking what division Pitbull would you want in, him if what, he was dude, doing that? Fucking Pitbull was in tournament after tournament, war after war, yeah. rivalry after rivalry. Like, rivalry. You just don't walk out of that very easily. It's just not. But, like, it's just... him, imagine inserting him at featherweight in the UFC for fun. Imagine him and Max. You wouldn't be if like. If you had told me that two years ago, I'd be more interested. But now I'm like, mm, I don't know, you know. I would see a rematch with, with him and Chandler, but they're too Chandler's too big now, but right? Too big. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. yeah. Yeah, whatever. Uh let's go over to at Luke Locusta one nine nine. Prime Deontay Wilder versus old big George. Ooh. So he's saying the George Foreman of the nineties who knocked out Michael Moore to win the heavyweight title at forty five or prime. How Deontay. good of a boxer was Big George in his forties? Like just pure boxing. How good was he? 
uh, well, he certainly wasn't known for it, but dude, he still had it in that area. Like in that comeback was like a slow build comeback. Like that comeback started in the late eighties and he took a shitload of fights and was, went through wars. And don't forget he originally fought Holyfield for the title and fought well, but lost. And everyone thought he was done then. And he made another turnaround and put fights together and big wins. But like, um, yeah, he could box. He could box, dude. He's going to win this matchup because George has a great chin, a great chin. I mean, when Ali got him, it was more like exhaustion and embarrassment for that knockout that actually happened there. Um, and, you know, I know George Foreman has been, you know, that I just watched the other night. Have you ever seen his fight with Ron Lyle, Luke Foreman Lyle? I don't think so. It was after Foreman lost the title to Ali and was trying to make another run. And they knocked each other down like three times each in the first like four and a half rounds. Like just ridiculous mayhem. Dude, you got to see that fight. It's it's insanity. It's just, it's two exhausted men throwing bombs. It's like, it's like a school fight in the hallway that no teacher is there to break it up. And you're like, we've been here for 15 minutes now. Like it's down to like stamina and will who's got that dog in him. You know what I'm saying, Luke? And where's the damn teacher, right? What kind of school is this? That happened in my school a lot, dude, but a lot. Okay. Yeah, there were wow. fights in my school. Not my second one so much, but my first high school, Valdosta High School. Oh, yeah, you can Jesus. get effed up at Valdosta. You yeah. had to knuckle up early in that fucking place. Did they have a lot of pregnant girls there too, Luke, or am I going out of bounds? No, but that, my second high school did. My second high school had a, a <laughs> several. I mean, I was like, these girls are, they're out here fucking, huh, early. Okay, I mean, that, okay, I not, you see, you can't say that after I make a questionable offering and then look at the sandwich we just created, Luke. You know what I'm saying? I just couldn't Suddenly, believe kids at my age were like, I was like, how do you not use birth control or protection? Like, how do you not? How do you not? Well, you just like punch I could your explain life. It Who to does you, that? Luke. I, I could explain the reasoning to you, but you know, it'd take a few minutes here and it'd probably involve it'd probably be cleaner than two girls in one cup. I'm so lucky I didn't walk into that bee's nest that time. Luke. You're still gonna I watch would... that. No, You're still gonna no, watch that. No, no. I'm just gonna make that if I win okay bet, I'm just gonna make two girls one cup my concert. I'm just gonna make you watch my concert. <laughs> Dude, I bet you would would Cannibal Corp score the soundtrack to that film, Luke? Probably, right? <laughs> No, no, probably. No. I don't know. R. Kelly. I don't know who. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, who that wow. Would be. Wow. <laughs> R. Kelly and the Cleveland Steamers. Yeah. Great band. <laughs> Luke, great band. Okay. Uh, this one's from uh, at Tim Yosho 650. Quick hits. His quick hit number one. Will MMA be better off in five years because of the recent merger? Yes or no? No. Will MMA be better off in 2028 because of this PFL Bell? He's asking right? about will the sport be better off. I don't know yes. if the sport will be better off. Um, I'll say no. You'll False. say no. Will UFC, PFL, or others benefit the most from the merger? Who will benefit the most from this merger? PFL. I mean, you know. Yeah. I don't think UFC is going to benefit it, uh, benefit from well, it, but PFL definitely will. I counter that. UFC will benefit – from whatever level of success, in my opinion, that PFL has. Because once PFL... Look, you said it yourself. You were kind of dismissive saying, well, up to this point, who have they gotten besides Francis? And you're right. But I think it, everything changes early next year when they start this new deal at the new network. They have the pay-per-view ability now. They've, you know, they had to wait in Ganu and Jake Paul to be closer to ready. Now they got Cyborg. Look, they got the things that they've been trying to set up. So... I think it's more like, let's see how these things hit and whether they will lead to, you know, potential advancements in free agency. But I think any success they have in the process, it's going to make UFC just tighten up just a little bit more and bring it a little bit more. In my opinion, Luke, unless they are like so like asleep at the wheel and so tied to like the numbers and we must hit this mark. And I mean, they're, they're really smart. And from the Endeavor angle, they're making a shit ton of money. They're they're, But... Do you think they'll fight back? I think they fight back if PFL starts having some moments. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, the competition could be... I think the person or the entities that might benefit the most if there is real competition is you and me and the folks out there watching, yeah. the consumers, you know? That's who. Yeah, that's who's right. supposed to be benefiting from competition is us, right? Yeah, I like when, when we win, Luke. I declare victory there. And finally, will this merger and the PFL framing as 1B lead to ufc upping their game yeah we just said it we think they will so that covers that uh we got a couple more and then we can let you guys uh go back to uh choke holding someone over a playstation 
I see you. I know you were. I know the look. Do you think you know how we always debate like what percentage of our audience was there January 6th or at least were, were willing and able if, if, if the reserves were called in, Luke? What percentage of the audience in this case do you think have done dirtbag level Black Friday waits where they were willing to like run in and elbow grandma out of the way to like get to that piece of electronic? Solid 97.3%. Oh, Solid. that's aggressive. That's aggressive. Solid. Okay. Solid. There's definitely people watching this right now who have punched a lady in the head over a microwave. 100%. All right. All right. Yep. There it is. Uh, at Jaeger Meister Jaeger 7794. How are your guys' barbecue cooking skills? Any special Thanksgiving meals you prepare? We already did the turkey day talk, but Luke. I will say the the fried turkey I did a few years ago remains like the apex turkey prep that's ever happened in my family, no matter what they might tell you. Um, frying a oh, turkey. Oh, you're declaring, is, wait, you're declaring this a victory for, for the Luke Thomas household in the family hierarchy. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. My sister, down. I mean, to be, let me be very clear about this. My sister and my brother are infinitely better cooks than me. Like, no question about it. Skill for skill, dish for dish, they crush me. They can't, I cannot touch them. But I'm the only one who's ever tried a fried turkey. And I did, I did a lot of prep. I mean, I brined this thing and salted it the whole nine yards. I got a heritage turkey. You know what a heritage turkey is? No. Right? You just get the regular old bitch-ass turkey from Piggly Wiggly? I don't eat much of the turkey. I'm a meat pie guy, all right? Hair pie? All right. Well, well, maybe. I mean, I get, I get a heritage turkey, it, huh? which, is, which is much better. Um, and I fried that motherfucker with all the special gear that I bought in peanut oil. And I i mean, I mathematically had everything down precise. I did it exactly as they recommended it for exactly how long. I pulled that fucking thing out and we sliced it. And when the knife went into the, the thigh, yeah. I mean, juices flying out Oh, that it was like, is that you, Peter? You know what I mean? Mr. I know, North. no, it Mr. was North, like... This is a public event. Yeah. yeah, I was like, you know, I don't know what gender this turkey was before we killed it, but it's squirting now, boy. Let me tell you. Anyway. Oh, wow. So... <laughs> That is, wow, wow. Luke, you know what I just realized? Turns out it's you, just piss. Did you know that? You think? <laughs> that was R. Kelly's defense. Uh, Luke, the thing about uh, you and I is you always think we're so different, but we're really the same. You claiming victory on that one year that you outcooked your brother and sister is my bloody toe game from 04. Come on. Yeah, that's fair. Like I said, dude, I could never, I could, there's just no chance I could ever, 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 ever compete with them dish for dish. I would lose 99.9% .9 of it, but I'm the only one who, because the thing is this, frying a turkey is in a way easy, but you do have to have um, all the right like materials to do it, the right drum, the right oil, the right temperature, everything, you know, the right thing to pull and pull the, uh, push them, pull the turkey out. And by the way, but this is the best part about it. Like all that goes into the prep, I believe the turkey that we cooked only was 18 minutes. So 18 minutes into the fryer, out, and then you serve it and it was done. Dude, it is, if you've never had real fried turkey, you yeah. just haven't had turkey. You haven't had turkey. You just you haven't, haven't had it. It's a fate. That's one of our greatest moments <laughs> in the, the show. The Luke fried turkey rant. Yeah, we've been yeah. there. Um, fried Luke, turkey, are baby. you? Do you think you're in the top two of your dad's favorite kids at the moment? No, no, no. Bottom uh, third, bat and uh, clean up. I mean, you got to be. You know, I am not top of the order. <laughs> let me tell you. Okay, here we go. I wow, told you my dad the right. other day. My dad, let me, so it's not just my dad. Like, my family, they've never asked me or commented on any of my tattoos. Like, none of them ever, not once. They've never been like, hey, why'd you get this? Where'd you get this? Like, hey, you know, what is this? They just never, just never. And that's fine. Like, if you don't care and you don't want to talk about it, I, it's, I'm okay. But then the other day, my dad was asking me something. We were, we were walking, and he asked me, and he goes, you know, uh, uh, he was like, um, I forget exactly what preceded what he said. And then he was like, yeah, you know, and then the people who like uh, the less attractive parts of society, they seem to also love tattoos. And I was like... Yeah, and cage fighting, Dad. They love that too. You know. I mean? and, and he yeah. was like, and I, he goes, I can't even fathom why they might get them, but uh, you know, it can't be decorative. And I'm like, well, it actually can be, you know. But anyway, so that was. Bait or, wait, did he not take the bait, or you were just trying to keep it civil? 
Um, little column A, column B. I was like, well, right. you know, Dad, that's a sort of an absurd statement, but um, but yeah, okay. That's this is incredible. I I would love to be a planted with a hidden MK documentary camera during your Thanksgiving dinner and just kind of keep the audience abreast of the direction, the flow of the conversation, who's winning, who's losing. That would be, that would be yeah, fantastic. I'm always losing here. Oh, I mean, not, not right. that I, not that I deserve to be losing, but I am always losing. Uh, they want to know if we can barbecue and how our cooking skills. So I'm a horrific cook. I'm okay on the barbecue grill. I would not say I'm very good. I can have disastrous moments. Uh, just watch. I can have disastrous moments. But uh, once in a while, I, I land the plane on the grill. Not a good cook in the indoors. Luke, you can, you can, you're pretty, you're a Renaissance man in some regards. You're an Eagle Scout and you know how to cook, right? Uh, a little bit, not not that not that much. I mean, I can. I'm like you a little bit. Like I can definitely cook a steak really well. I can cook, um, uh, not all fish, but I could cook like a big chunk of tuna or something like that. You know, I can do that. I've never been able to grill poultry all that well. I've always fucked that up. Um, yeah. So no. So the if, listen, if you got like chorizo, if you've got like flank steak, if you've got some kind of you know meatiness in that way, I'm, I'm probably good for it. But short of that, I'm gonna fuck it up. Yeah, I'm with you on that. From Donegan Anderson, 3561 says, uh, day one donk here. What was your most gratifying career milestones? And what was one of your bleakest moments in the industry? Great question, Jeez. Luke. They want our highs and lows. Um, I got to tell you, I you know, I didn't think of it this way necessarily at the time, but like us winning the first MMA award that we did. Yeah, that know, felt man. big, right? It felt pretty felt, big. Felt fucking great to be honest with you. If I could, if, you know, I and and you know, that's not to say that it is the most because it it's all a matter of perception a little bit. Bleakest. Um when MMA fighting never let me say goodbye after being at the company for nearly 14 years and uh, just closed out all my accounts without telling me. And um, even though I had offered them the opportunity to match Showtime's offer and they just didn't, and then they locked me out of my email, locked me out of everything, and never even let me say thanks to the staff or anything. I thought that was... Uh... And also, you know, the MMA hour had not gone how I had wanted it to. Um yeah, that was probably pretty bleak. Or John Jones dunking on me. Those two days were both like, really? Like, okay. These are very honest moments from you, Luke. Those, those, those were, uh, those were turning point moments. Because look, they they can break a person, Luke. But you have persevered and elevated through that. I mean, are you you're a survivor, Luke? Right. Survivor, but like you know, have you ever seen like an animal survive in the wild? It's not really mentally stable. You know, it's all hardened and fucked up and uh, and angry yeah. and everything. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Um, you know, I could say either us winning the the first MMA award, or when we were when we found out in the moment that we were like the sports podcast of the year from the sports podcasting group, yeah. which led to us uh, main eventing their their London uh, podcast festival. Which, like that, all to me is one thing. That's probably it. That's probably the the best highest moment. I mean, um. You know, I mean, when like when I fill in for Jim Gray a couple times and I'm on like the major leagues, that also is like this Pretty moment great. of like, oh, shit, they called me up from the, you know, from AAA for the day. And look at this uh, lowest moment. I think it's definitely there was a point at ESPN when I was a editor making nothing but writing a ton of content all week, going to fights, covering it, working on TV and then like not getting paid in those areas, but like getting opportunities getting reps getting gigs but at the same time like unable to pay the rent like you know what i mean when you're starting to go like is this is this the best use of my skills in this current situation you know what i mean like the heat is due uh and then to find out at one of my reviews that like a promotion or this thing i thought i was building toward for three years and was told along the way oh not this time but like six months from now definitely we've all been through that where there's a little bit of a carrot hanging in front of you but you know what you're you can get over the walls and the hurdles and you keep coming well i had found out like behind the scenes that like the boss who was telling me all this like had never actually gone to bat for me once once i found out like how the hiring and promotion process like actually works and how you have to like nominate somebody and then go to bat for them repeatedly just to get them in the mix for that. And it was like, wow, all that work I put in 
for nothing. Now I didn't, I knew it wasn't nothing. Cause you know, I had some reps, I had great opportunities. I grew, but you know, that moment Luke, where you're like, I don't think I can financially do this anymore. So am I being selfish to my family, keeping us in this rental house that we can't even afford to live in? And I literally just had to borrow uh, money from the church to pay the heating bill. Like you, there's those, there's those moments. That's the lowest moment in this, in this walk so far, hopefully it's low. It'll stay the lowest Luke, but those are the moments where, you do a lot of soul searching because that's all I'll you got what, left. I will, I will also know? say just as we wrap up on this, you know, w w when we officially behind the scenes, I mean, we kind of found out what everyone else did, but when we basically got a heads up that like Showtime was going away, I don't think it kicked your ass as hard as it kicked mine, but dude, it kicked my ass. It kicked my ass real bad. I was fucked up for a while off that, you know, uh, just the amount of questions that it raised in my head about who I am and the, the choices that I'd made and what the fuck I was going to do. And, you know, again, everyone wore, everyone wore the, the difficulties of that situation in the last year differently. And I'm not saying I took it well. I, I probably didn't. But no, I, I know I didn't. But um, it fucked me up real good, dude. That, was, that fucked me up for a while. I was off for a while from that. But so, you know, we, we, but like, like we, we persevered. Like, here we are. We're on the other side of it, yeah. it seems like. Or mostly on the other side of it anyway. So... Um, That's why, you, you know, know what, if we get this award and we don't know if we are the, the third straight world MMA awards, best MMA programming, you can argue all you want. If we deserve it after a tough year, we didn't have the same resources we had, but we also had some of our highest moments and some of our lowest moments. I'm starting to think Luke that we actually deserve it. As we've talked about that, this actually is the year yeah. that we dug in and fought for it the most, because you know what, that's all you can do. Like, okay. If you want to know postscript, what happened after my lowest moment, a couple months later, I was so frustrated and just ready to run through a wall and get noticed and accepted for the work I've done and all that, that I had a Jerry Maguire moment accidentally. I would get poison ivy like easily when I would weed whack. Like I just get like, you know, a splash on you and my whole body would start to get covered and it would like come up and threaten to come up like my face too. So I got on a pretty good rhythm of getting prednisone, you know, the steroid that like kind of aggressively turns it away the only problem was it would make me like aggressively uh unkept emotionally like it would just make me like extra argumentative so the family knew to just keep distance for a week i took a double dose because i had a big on camera thing coming up and the thing was crawling up my neck you know you've seen me before luke with that where it's crawling up it's trying to come out right and dude i took a double dose and i lost my ability to hold my emotions i'd be working in the office and just start crying and then like hope no one's looking at it or then like i'd be you know over the top excited that night i couldn't sleep was was like you know what if my career's going nowhere i'm gonna go out swinging and i drafted an email to the head of espn.com literally at 3 a.m that was this aggressive like ambitious but like also like i don't want you guys to miss out what i'm about to bring here and i didn't know if i was like, gonna get fired or told like there's the door and i ended up on that dude's couch the next morning um half apologizing for kind of losing my mind there in the moment but i think he respected it and it and it started to open the door to new opportunities mm. for me maybe because i was that bold and crazy and out of my mind literally like just full emotions and uh Look where I am today, Luke. So maybe a couple of breakdowns along the way is, are okay if you can make it to the finish line. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, after I got the door shut in my face by MMA fighting for doing nothing other than carrying that place when no one else would, um, you know, I ended up in the arms of Showtime. So like, yeah, you know, sometimes you get these really low moments where you're like, Jesus, fuck, how did I end up here? And then you just be, you know, like, life is funny. Life is, it doesn't work this way for everybody. We've been, we, you know, we've had our asses kicked. Life's kicked our asses a few times. You know, we've had our asses oh, kicked, yeah. no doubt about it. Right. But um, we've managed to, we've managed to pick ourselves up and keep going, you know? That's all you can do. We're all in this together. Uh, we hope you enjoyed our holiday, holiday mailbag this Turkey Day. Maybe you don't celebrate it in your country, but happy Thanksgiving to you just the same. If that means anything, thank you to Mikey Morms on the ones and twos behind the scenes. And we appreciate yes. all your questions. Continue to send whatever you want to morning combat at gmail.com fan subs, dead wrongs, all that. Maybe just say hi. Just try to keep your, your extremities clothed, clothed in the future. Um, that's about all I got. Luke, any message here on the way out? Uh, be sure to check my coverage of tonight's fights for PFL. I'll be there. 
I'll do what I can. I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to get, but I'm going to get what I can and uh, should be kind of fun. So be on the lookout for that YouTube.com slash Morning Combat. There it is. Boom. There it is. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your holiday weekend. If you did something awful in a Best Buy, email us with more details and pictures. Thank you. We love you. We're out of here. Happy holidays to you. The Scudetto, where the soul of Italy meets the pinnacle of Calcio. Catch Seria on CBS Sports Network and streaming live on Paramount+. Plus. It's never too soon for college hoops. It's the Emerald Coast Classic on CBS Sports Network.